Hello, everyone. In this video, we'll be talking about Yoth parameters, also known as Hoth parameters, depending on where you're coming from. And the idea over here is that we are going to describe a set of parameters that you can directly extract from the time domain. So you don't have to go to the frequency domain and extract any parameters over here. So the whole idea of Yoth parameters is that they form some sort of a bridge between the physical time domain interpretation and the conventional frequency domain description. Uh, the reason that why we are presenting Yoth parameters, and this is something pretty much old actually, is that nowadays when I'm reviewing some of the papers for IEEE journals and many other journals, I see most of the, let's say, PhD candidates and like researchers in general, jump straight away to using a like 15 layers um, CNN model and put the latest like developments over there, but nobody is actually like comparing to the baseline. So the first question is usually, what is wrong with the baseline? Like if you are developing something based on convolution neural network or any other model, specifically for the classification of EMG or EEG signals, like you have to give us some sort of description. What is wrong with the baseline? Why don't you use traditional algorithms? Like how much are you achieving on top of what the traditional algorithms are achieving already? And in some publications, you'll be surprised when you read that using a like deep convolution neural network, they managed to achieve 2% or 1%. So let's dive in and let's have a look at your parameters and see what this is all about. So in the introduction about both parameters, so, or your, sorry, your parameters were initially presented as quantitative terms that generally characterize an EEG trace. So the idea over here is that um, you have a set of EEG signals, and these are the electroencephalogram signals collected from a human brain, either invasively or non-invasively, depending on the approach. But the idea is that they were extracted based on the EEG signals, and they pro provide descriptive like parameters that are, that are entirely based on the time domain. But they can be also derived from statistical moments of the power spectrum. So the method provides a bridge between physical time domain interpretation and the conventional frequency domain description. And that's the beauty about it. So the proposed method offers a way for online measurements of basic signal properties. Now, because these parameters are very like uh, computationally efficient, like they don't cost a lot in terms of the computational cost. So they are very attractive for building an online measurement system of the signal property. What I'm trying to say is that you have a set of parameters that can capture properties about the frequency domain or the power spectrum of a specific signal that you are analyzing directly from the time domain. So you don't have even to use the FFT. That's the beauty of it. You are sitting in the time domain, looking at the frequency domain without even going there and extracting some parameters in a very efficient manner. And this is all what your or Hoth parameters are all about. So to start with the um, analysis or description of your parameters, let's just remind you quickly about the Fourier transform and Fourier analysis. So Fourier transform is a mathematical formula that relates a signal sampled in the time domain, like this one that you see over here, or like space uh, to the um, same signal sampled in frequency domain. So basically, I have a signal in the time domain. It is made of a number of frequencies. And for us to have a look at the contribution of these frequencies in my signal, I have to have a, like a tool like the Fourier transform or fast Fourier transform, basically, that I can use to go from the time domain to the frequency domain, observe the characteristics, or let's say, sorry, like the contribution of these frequencies into my signal and take it from there. So in signal processing, Fourier transform can reveal important characteristics of the signal, namely its frequency components. So if you have a sampled signal in the time domain, as you can see over here, by applying the Fourier transform, you get the power spectrum, which is another set of lollipops that represent the frequencies that contribute to your signal, like what frequencies. So if you look at the uh, index of the x-axis, that will be the frequency. 
And the uh, specific contribution of that frequency is the height of that lollipop. So that's the beauty about the, let's say, Fourier analysis or basically a time domain frequency domain analysis. The concept behind Hoth or Yoth, as I said, is that uh, there are two domains that we are looking at today, time domain and frequency domain. And then when I have a specific signal, whether it's EEG signal or any other signal, EMG, whatever other signal that you are having, if you have one of these signals in the time domain, you use the FFT to look at its power spectrum. So in the time domain, you have, you have on the x-axis is the time, and on the y-axis is the amplitude, while in the frequency domain on the x-axis will be the frequency, and the y-axis will be the power spectrum, like the contribution of that specific frequency to your signal. What we want to do over here is that we want to extract some sort of characteristics of the frequency domain, of the power spectrum. I want to extract some sort of characteristics or features or descriptors about this power spectrum. And for that, we usually refer like to the definition of moments. So moments of the power spectrum. So the nth moment definition, so M refer to the moment and N is the order of that moment. So we say the nth moment of the power spectrum is equivalent to the integration the frequency, the radian frequency, raised to the power of n times s of w, and that's the contribution of that specific frequency. So all what you have to do is take the specific frequency from the x-axis, which could be either in hertz or in radian. So could, you can call it f or w if it's 2 pi f. So take the frequency, raise it to the power of n, multiplied by the contribution of that frequency and add. That's all what you have to do to extract the moments. So what we are saying here today is that I don't have to go from the time domain to the frequency domain to apply this. I can stay in the time domain and look from the time domain, observe these characteristics and extract them directly from here using something called the Fourier transform properties. So Fourier transform has a set of properties, and these properties tell you about the mathematical operation or processes that you can apply in one domain and what it translates to in the other domain. So you have time domain, you have frequency domain, and these are the processes that you can apply in the time domain. And over here, it tells you what happened to the frequency domain representation of that signal when you apply this specific time domain representation and vice versa. The most famous example that we always refer back to when we study signal analysis or signal theory in general, we always say multiplication in one domain equals convolution in the other domain. So if you have two signals, the multiplication of x1 and x2 in the time domain give you what the um, convolution of the power spectrum, basically. As you can see here, the star. The star refers to the convolution. So multiplication in one domain equals convolution in the other domain. And similarly over here, if you multiply in the time domain, you get convolution. Sorry, if you multiply in the frequency domain, you get convolution in the time domain, and so on. So the Fourier transform is a major cornerstone in the analysis and representation of signals and linear time invariant systems. And its elegance and importance cannot be overemphasized. And most of its usefulness stem directly from the properties of Fourier transform. So in the previous slide, I mentioned that I want to extract the moments of the power spectrum. And someone will be asking me specifically, why do you want the moments? Well, because the moments describe some sort of important properties. If you remember the mean and variance skewness kurtosis. So the first moment is the what? The average. The second one is the variance. The third is the skewness. The fourth is kurtosis. And that's what this N tells you about. So M1, M2, M3, and 4 Now, if I want to describe the shape of the power spectrum, 
I can use the moments and will give me some sort of information about the power spectrum of a signal. But as I said, I don't want to go to the frequency domain. I don't want to use Fourier transform. Maybe I have a platform that is computationally like very limited and I can't even like apply FFT. So what can I do? Well, you can extract some sort of important parameters, which are these parameters about the power spectrum directly from the time domain. So how do I do that? Look at this specific equation, okay? And it says W to the power of N multiplied by S of W. Go to the frequency domain and start observing here. Do I have something similar? And immediately when observing these, I found this one. So one of the properties, it's called the differentiation property. And in the time, like in the frequency domain representation, it has something very similar to what I need over here. So it's J of W to the power of N multiplied by X of W. So the differentiation property of the Fourier transform states that the nth derivative of the signal in the time domain is equivalent to multiplying the frequency raised to the power of n times x of w, which is the contribution of that specific frequency. But here x is in complex representation. So what we are going to do, we are going to use this property to work out the yoth descriptors. So basically, if you think about it, all what you need to do is take the derivative or like first order difference between like for the time domain signal to get the first moment and so on for the remaining moments. Okay, so derivative in the time domain will give you this some sort of representation and then all what you need is summation over here and summation over here, right? Mm, let's have a look. So that's what I need. That's a specific property that I'm going to rely on today. And we will take it from here. Now, let's go back to the um, shape of the power spectrum. As you know, the complete frequency description as derived by the means of the Fourier transform is always symmetric with respect to zero. So it has two identical branches, as you can see over here. They are identical and they stretch into the positive and the negative frequency. And the later being, in fact, no more mysterious than the analytical concept of the frequency itself. So I have the X of W. And as I said, like if you have ever applied the fast Fourier transform using Python or MATLAB, usually the outcome is what? A bunch of complex numbers. So the phase is excluded over here. So first of all, I don't deal, or we generally don't deal with complex numbers when we extract features. So we have to get rid of the complex nature of these like numbers. So what we do over here is we exclude the phase by multiplying that X of W by its conjugate, okay? Giving the power spectrum, which is S of W. So now you know where I'm going to get my S of W from. It's basically whatever the Fourier transform is giving you time its conjugate and conjugate has a star over here, as you know. So that my S of W is equivalent to X of W times the conjugate, which is X star of W. So now you know where, I'm, where am I going to get my S of W from, which is basically by taking the conjugate. The remaining part is just the frequency raised to the power, like nth power. So a consequence of this symmetry, like now if you like come think about it, okay, we got rid of the complex nature. Now they are like a set of numbers that we can deal with, but there is a tiny problem. If the power is odd over here, if this is one or three or any other odd number, when you integrate, so when you multiply odd numbers by these values, and integrate that with the positive numbers, sorry, like negative numbers by these values and positive numbers by these values, summation of that will be what? Zero. Why? Because it's exactly the same frequency. It's a symmetrical shape. And you're saying multiply the negative frequency by these values and the positive frequency by these values, add them all together, 
each one of them will cancel the other one from here when the power is odd. So a consequence of this symmetry is that in a statistical approach to the shape of the frequency distribution, all odd moments will become zero. So there will be no information in the linear average or in the skewness when you try to extract the information from the time domain. So again, you can go to the frequency domain and extract all the parameters like the even and the odd. But when you are trying to do it from the time domain, you have an issue because from the time domain, you get the complete spectrum and the complete spectrum is symmetric. And because of that, when you try to extract the moments from the time domain, you will not be able to extract the odd because the odd will cancel each other. So do you want to extract them? Do you want to extract the odd moments from the frequency domain directly? So you can go to the frequency domain, chop this in half, use only one half and extract any set of moments if you want to go to the frequency domain. But if you want to do it from the time domain, you are limited to the even ones only because all odd moments will become zero. Now, the first um, feature or descriptor from Yoth or Hoth is called the activity. The idea over here is that we rely on one of the properties of the Fourier transform, which says the energy in the time domain, which is actually not the property, it's a Parseval theorem actually. It says the energy of the signal in the time domain is equal to the energy of its transform. So activity is the first feature we extract Activity is represented by what? The zeroth order moment. So if I go back to the definition of the moment, we said it was what? It was n times x of w according to the Fourier transform table. And we said we are going to multiply it by its conjugate to square it. So if you get the energy of this, like the transform, basically the energy of the numbers over here in the frequency domain, it will be equivalent to the energy of the signal in the time domain. So the activity is the measure of the squared standard deviation or simply variance of the amplitude, sometimes referred to as variance or mean power. It represents the surface envelope of the power spectrum in the frequency domain. What we are relying upon over here is the Parseval's theorem. And that is the sum of the square of a function is equal to the sum of the square of its transform. So I wanted to extract a moment and that moment is the zeroth order moment. And you know that when you like raise the like power of W to zero, the result is what? One. So if I take W times X of W, well, W like, to the power of zero is one. So you lose it. What you end up with is just X of W multiplied by its conjugate. And the summation of that, according to Parseval's theorem is equivalent to what? the energy of the signal in the time domain. So the first moment of the power spectrum, you can get it directly from the time domain by just taking the energy. So just take the energy of the signal in the time domain, and that's equivalent to the zeroth order moment. So that's one. Now the mean power of the time function is recognized by a statistician as its variance. So you will see most of the papers referring to the Yoth parameters or Hoth parameters as some sort of variance descriptors. Let's go to the next one, the mobility. Again, what I have to do is that go back to the definition of the moment. So the second moment, m sub two, is equivalent to what? W to the power of two S of W. Now, if you remember again, S of W came from X time X conjugate. So what we say over here is that, okay, so this is squared and this is squared. So put them in two brackets and put the square on the bracket. And I know that W times X W, according to the time differentiation property that we talked about, it says the nth derivative of a function in the time domain is equivalent to multiplying the spectrum x of w by w raised to the nth power. So in this case, what do you think the nth power is over here? So the nth derivative of the time domain, again, is equivalent to 
multiplying x of w by w to the power of one, which means n is one. So the first derivative of the function in the time domain, you take d of f over dt and you square the whole lot according to like Parseval. Well, you want to get the energy. So what you did over here, so you take the derivative of the function in the time domain, square it, integrate it, that's your mobility. So, sorry, that's M2. And mobility is defined as the square root of what M2 by M0, the one that we defined in the previous slide. So as we said, M0 is the energy of the signal, just the energy. M2 is what the energy of the derivative of the signal. So take the de derivative, like first order derivative, square it, integrate it, and divide that by the energy of the signal and then square root for the whole thing. And that's called mobility. Now, the even moments of the power spectrum correspond to variance in the time domain. Again, so we are referring back to the like variance. A measure of standard deviation of the slope. Now we're talking about the slope because we took the derivative. So a measure of standard deviation of the slope with reference to the standard deviation of the amplitude. It's expressed as the ratio per unit, uh, per time unit, and may be conceived also as a mean frequency. So mobility, okay, is also um, conceived as a mean frequency. And keep that in mind because I'll show you another definition for mobility or another term for, for it. So since these qualities are equally dependent on the mean amplitude, the ratio will be dependent on the curve shape only, and in such a way that measures the relative average slope. Now, let's move to the next one, or the next parameter of Yoth or Hoth. So again, it will be an even number because we can't extract the odd from the time domain. So it will be an even number. I will raise w to the power of four multiplied by s of w. And I know s of w is x times x conjugate. Okay, so I'm gonna put any, everything in brackets, take the power of two outside, and I have two remaining over here because this is to the power of four. So it tells me the, like um, using time differentiation property, the nth derivative of a function in a time domain is equivalent to multiplying spectrum by w raised to the nth power. The nth power over here is what? Two. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the second derivative of the function in the time domain, square it, integrate it, and that's my m4. And complexity then is defined as m4, the one that you just got from here, by m2, the one that you just got in the previous slide, and square root of that. So again, the even moments of the power spectrum correspond to variances in the time domain. And that's why people usually talk about variances when remembering your parameters. So this is a measure of the similarity of the shape of the signal to a pure sine waveform. It's expressed as the number of standard slopes generated during the average time required for the generation of one standard amplitude as given by the mobility. Leave all of this aside. I'll show you another explanation, which is kind of simple for you to rem remember. So now we have three parameters from your activity, which is just the energy of the signal in the time domain. Mobility, which was the energy of the derivative divided by the energy of the signal and complexity, which is the energy of the second derivative divided by the energy of the first derivative and square root of that. So activity, mobility, complexity. Believe it or not, I've seen people applying Hoth or Yoth parameters on EEG signals and having their accuracies jumping from 80 something into 99, nearly like 98 something for an offline experiment, long time ago. And the surprise was really huge about what these descriptors can do, depending on the data, of course, and the problem you are trying to solve. Now, um, we have also used these Yoth parameters previously in one of our publications, and we have added to it like a couple of others, like descriptors. 
So you can read more about what we have done specifically over there in this paper. So at the time we also like extracted M0, M2, M4, but we raise it to the power of lambda and divided by the lambda, which is power transformation to make it robust to noise. And then we applied logarithm as well. In this paper, if you go and read this paper, so the features that we extracted over there, we try to relate them to the Kepstra representation. So you know with the Kepstra representation, what you do is that you take the signal from the time domain to the frequency domain by using FFT. You take the log and then you take IFFT. While in that, in that paper, what we did, we extracted the parameters like three your parameters plus another three that we added. We extracted these from the original signal and from a nonlinear version of the original signal. And then we correlated the two because we were interested at well, like looking at the orientation of the features rather than the feature value directly. Now, let's say that you are interested in this subject and you learned about the like moments of the power spectrum. You went to Google, you open the browser, you start to typing moments of the power spectrum, and you were surprised, like you have two definitions. You immediately find these in any of the, like let's say um, books, especially the old books, where they will tell you like the number of zero crossings per unit time is equivalent to the second moment divided by zero moment. And the number of extrema or peaks is given by M4 divided by M2. Square root for this, square root for that. Isn't that related to what we just shown to you? Mobility, complexity, square root of M2 over M0 or M0, and square root of M4 divided by M2. Well, I can say it's the same. Okay, so you can read more about these like features in this stack exchange question, which is really interesting. What is meant by spectral moment? In terms of the zero crossing, like why do they call it a zero crossing, that division like of M2 by M0 and square root of that? So there's something called the Gabu bandwidth G of a signal and is usually given by this definition. So in this case, um, X of F squared, okay, divided by M0 is effectively a probability density of the zero mean random variable whose variance is G squared as you can see over here. So a sinusoid, in this case, a sinusoid of a frequency G has what? 2G zero crossings per second. And that G is represented by square root of M0 over M0. So a sinusoid of a frequency G, and let's imagine G is five Hertz, will have a what? 2G zero crossings. So let's have a look at the zero crossing. So this is the level of zero. Let's see how many times that I cross or touch this zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Okay? And that's how you find it. So square root of M2 over M0, you will also find it defined in the literature as relating to the zero crossings. Number of extrema. So as you know, if you wanna look at the number of peaks, what you can do in one simple way to find the peaks is take the derivative of a signal and look for the zero crossings again, because the peak in the original signal converts to a zero crossing when you take the derivative. So repeat the analysis by using the Gabo bandwidth definition, but this time on the derivative of the signal, and then you get M4 over M2, square root of that. Now we added a couple more features to these parameters, including the sparsiness, which quantifies how much energy of a vector is packed in only a few parameters or components. And that's M0 divided by square root of M0 minus M4 and square root of M0 minus M2. You can read more about this in the paper. And the irregularity factor. So at the time we said, okay, if the zero crossing is represented by this and the number of peaks is represented by this, there is a definition for irregularity factor, which says it's the number of zero crossing divided by the number of peaks. Divide these parameters, and what you get is M2 divided by M0 over M4. 
So this specific definition that we have used for EMG signal analysis has also been used by others to study like different problems. Here's one example that I listed for you. In that paper, they actually look at the irregularity factor of different signals and show you examples where the irregularity factor can be small or it can be large, like 0.22 or 0.97. You can go and read the internet like paper if you're interested. So they say over here, the frequency band is narrow and over here, the frequency band is broad. Now, if you are studying, for example, ocean waves, you will find another definition, which is also including or referring to M0, M4 and M2 combinations. So instead of like having the square root of these parameters, they have added another term to it. And they call this epsilon, which is the spectrum bandwidth. And they say, if the spectrum bandwidth is bigger than 0.5, you have a broadband waveform. And then if it's lower than 0.5, then you have a narrow band. In typical ocean, epsilon is like 0.5 to 0.6. And here are examples again of a narrow band and a broadband. So you can read more about it in the corresponding like link over here. Um, there is another example from the MIT open course courses. So you can find over there the definition of the average zero up crossing period. So up crossing, it means this one and this one. So where it went across the zero to go up, this one went down, actually the signal went down, so it's not counted. And this is the next up crossing. And that's the first period, it's called TZ of I. The next one will be from here to here, because again, this is not counted, it's going downward. And that definition is now given as the average zero up crossing period. So this one, this one, and many others then average them. Similarly, again, the percentages of M2 and M4, they take it now as an average peak to peak period. So look at the example they provided over there. So peak to peak period and peak to peak period and then average all of these periods. So these kind of parameters have been used in the liter literature since a long time. And people have been recommending these parameters saying they are very useful for any kind of signal. And I showed you here like on EEG, on ocean waves, on many other waves. In addition to that, now because we are taking the derivative of the signal and this then is the second derivative, so what comes to my mind straight away is why don't you just look at then the waveform length as well while looking at these parameters? So the waveform length is simply the cumulative length of the waveform over the time segment. So for any signal x, if you take the derivative, and take the absolute of the derivative and sum that, it will give you the waveform length. What does that mean? It means if I have a signal like this, and if I hold the two ends by my hand and stretch it out, I can compute the length of the signal, just like here. So that um, wiggly kind of signal that I have is being stretched out by holding the two ends and stretching out and computing the length. So what does this value tell me, like the length of the signal? Well, the resultant value gives a measure of the waveform amplitude, frequency, and duration, all within the single parameter. So this is one of the very powerful features as well for EMG and EEG signal analysis. Now, going back to the original paper from Hoth or Yoth, the parameters were given like this, again, the input signal, Square it, integrate it, that's activity. Take the derivative, square it, integrate it, divide it by the activity, you get mobility. Mobility, so remember, they also call this in the literature as zero crossing. Why is it related to mobility? Maybe because if you have more zero crossing, it means mobility is increasing or decreasing. So take the next derivative, second derivative, square it, integrate it, divide it by M2, and you get complexity. So what we said over there, okay, keep the original three, apply some sort of normalization to make them more robust. And you can extract also the sparseness, irregularity factor, and the waveform length. Or you can take the ratio of the waveform length, like basically of the signal, and then waveform length of the derivative over here, because it involves like one step of derivative. 
So these are the parameters. I highly recommend that if you are like experimenting with like EEG or EMG or any other signal analysis, I highly recommend that go apply these first. Don't jump straight away to deep neural networks and try like to show me that an accuracy that I probably can achieve already with simple features like these with an LDA classifier. And yes, there are many examples that I've experimented with. The features are not bad at all. Don't underestimate the power of these features, even that they are directly estimated from the time domain, because your problem may not be complicated enough to require a like a giant convolution neural network with 15 layers. So start with something simple, experiment, get to understand the signal that you know, extract all of traditional features, play with the traditional features. If you see that the power is not enough, it's not giving you like the classification accuracy that you are after, or you wanna enhance more, only then start playing with the deep neural networks. Because at the end of the day, if you are going to put a product, your product, like if it's a wearable, for example, you might be limited by the computational, like let's say cost or computational capability of the hardware. So in many instances, if something like this give you a decent performance, you will find that eventually this is the product, this is the sort of algorithms that actually go into a product rather than your deep convolution neural network. It depends, it depends on the platform, it depends on um, the cost as well and so many other parameters. So my suggestion, experiment with these. And if you are publishing, publish the performance of these against the performance of your achievement with the CNN or any other like fancy model, at least to give us some sort of confidence that you have done something, you have experimented with the traditional approach is not good enough. And that's why you went to the latest developments. Don't jump straight away to the latest development because then the question is what's wrong with the traditional approach? You didn't show us that. And that's the whole idea of today of your auth or auth parameters. So yeah, and finally, here is an example of the like um, signal arbitrary reference. This is how it looks like when you have increased activity. This is how it looks like when you have increased mobility. So the period gets like shorter mobility again, and the increased complexity, which is referred to M4 divided by M2, which is estimating the close, like how close the shape is to a pure sine wave. So yeah, that's all about it. And if you want to read more, go and read your or whole paper from the 1970s. Yes, 1970. And this is one of the really nice papers to read about EEG signal feature extraction. So thank you very much. And I hope you learned something new today. Thank you.